going to get started in just a minute or so. So grab your pizza and make your way back to your seats. Um, we have a lot of great content lined up for tonight, so we hope everyone leaves with at least one more piece of Elasticsearch information than they came with. Uh, before we get into uh, the presentations, I just want to thank Jason and the Facebook team for having us in this wonderful new space and hosting us so graciously, giving us pizza and drinks when no one's hungry. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so what we have lined up first, Brad is going to present on some of the new 6.5 features that we have um, that we recently released. And then next, George and team are going to present on what it takes to scale out a large elastic uh, logging cluster. And I didn't introduce myself. My name's Lindsay. I work for Elastic. I've been there just about two years supporting our New England community. So thank you all for being here because we wouldn't have a community without you. So really excited to see what our presenters have lined up for us. And I'll pass it to Brad. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> Get me psyched up a little bit here. All right. Woo! All right. Woo! So thank you for uh, just you know coming out to um, listen to us speak tonight. I mean everybody's got family and friends, all kinds of other you know things they can be doing, uh, but you're here to listen to us talk about the uh, Elastic Stack. And uh, my name is Brad Quarry. I'm a senior solutions architect uh, with Elastic. I run around Boston talking to you know all sorts of companies about their architectures, how to solve problems, install software, architect solutions to be successful, you know years out that kind of thing. Um, and today I've, you know, got content on, you know, all the new stuff we've brought in with uh, the Elastic Stack version 6.5. And uh, it's a fire hose of like 20 new features we've put in. Do six little mini demos just so you can get a sense for how some of the features work. Um, and we'll just, you know, we'll get right into it here. So it's important to kind of start out with, you know, we have a six to eight week release cycle, which is a lot different than what I'm used to coming into the uh, this universe from the database background because it was like a monolithic, you know, maybe twice a year, once a year, big release of software and you kind of keep track of it and all the features. But with a six week, week release cycle, it's really hard to keep track of what's going on, what's the new stuff, how can I benefit from it, how can I use it in my applications. So that's why it's very helpful for us to do these sessions is to educate and say, you know, here's what we got in the stack, here's the new stuff, here's the direction that we're going in, um, to see if, you know, what you're doing aligns to it. And, you know, no one has time to read all the release notes. They're coming out fast and furious. They're detailed. Everybody's got a busy day. Um, so that's why we have these sessions. And I used to poll the group and say, you know, who wants to just hear about the free stuff or the paid stuff or you know, how it all, you know, what are you interested in hearing about? And usually folks just say, hey, look, give, it a, give me all the content. I'll figure out if what you're talking about is interesting to me or my applications. Um, and so we just talk about from an educational sense. It's not like a pitch or a sales kind of thing. It's just kind of like here it is, and if it's interesting to you in your application, you can check it out. So little tidbits like, you know, did you know about replication in the stack? Did you know about SQL and the infra ops UI and some of the new stuff we're doing? Um, you know, only only possible just through some educational sessions like this. So when I talk to you know a lot of folks in the field, I get a lot of you know very consistent and common questions around different functionality, uh, how do we do certain things in the stack, I wish you had this, I wish you had the ability to fill this gap, and you know, I hear things like, can I replicate between two clusters, can I replicate indice data, can I connect via ODBC and JDBC so I can leverage my VA VI apps on, on Elastic, um, can I leverage Beats in a serverless environment, how does that work, is that even possible, can I, you know, monitor my infrastructure and my uh, operation systems, you know, through Kibana with, you know, some sort of curated UI versus creating something custom. And the answer is yes, you can do all this stuff. And with each release of the stack, we really try to honor the idea of we're an open source company. We want to be building features that the open source community can leverage. Uh, but we also have to protect some of the development efforts uh, and not just let the whole world sort of strip mine <laughs> uh, all of our efforts. So. You will notice there is what's called a basic license, but it also says free next to it. I'll go into what basic is in a minute. This is sort of a innovation of you know the last six to eight months or so. Um, but you know this this presentation basically includes you know mostly free usable stuff. So like 75% of these features you can just go leverage today. So it's not like it's behind a paywall or subscription. But you know Elastic only exists uh, because of the those kind of premium features we call out to sort of fund the company. 
So, but you know, we really try to stay on the mantra of we are open source. You know, we want to provide features back to the community that are relevant and useful. We don't want to just you know throw the shaft out there and say good luck. Uh, there's some cool stuff in there. So, what is the basic license? Uh, the easiest way to say it is Amazon can't use it. <laughs> uh, <b> <laughs> Uh, but the, the long and the short of it is basically uh, we don't want folks taking all the stuff that we build and then uh, creating directly competitive solutions in like a SaaS environment, for example. So you can go use it all you want for any you know, internal applications, logging applications, search applications, anything you want internally, it's free forever to use it for that case. Uh, but you know, don't build stuff that directly competes with our, <laughs> with our use cases. Um, because otherwise we just, you know, would go out of business, wouldn't be a business model. So that's the basic license. Don't be scared of it. Use it to your heart's content um, and build your applications using these, this stuff. So the basic format of slides will just be the kind of feature we're going to talk about. It doesn't really show up on here. Um, the feature will, in context of the slide, it's state. So some of them are kind of experimental or beta. Uh, and then the uh, the license category it's in, so just kind of get a sense for the slide format. And I'll bounce back and forth between the basic open source and uh, platinum stuff. So cross-cluster replication is a really a marquee feature of 6.5. It's been asked for a very long time. You know, before we introduced this, you basically had to fire up some sort of message queue architecture. Uh, and like officials, we had two, cl two Elasticsearch clusters and two uh, different geographic areas uh, have a local, say, for example, Kafka cluster. It's ingesting data from Elastic, syncing to another remote Kafka cluster that then in like a pub-sub manner, you pull data out of Kafka topics to load into Elastic. So it takes time, money, effort to build that out. You need expertise to do that. It's just, you know, really heavy lifting. So folks are like, you know, it'd be really nice if you just had some native replication built in. Uh, and it's really been in the works for a long time, but we finally have it in a beta sense. And it's an asynchronous replication currently. So I think synchronous is something that we'll be working on in the future, but you can kind of achieve uh, similar results even with async, depending on how you set it up. Uh, it's a leader follower model. So you define a leader index, and followers will pull data from the leader index to keep uh, followers up to date. And leaders are not aware of the follower indices. They just uh, subscribe to it. And we sync data using a write-ahead log on each of the nodes and ship the updates to uh, well the, the follower polls from those that write-ahead log to keep its uh, index up to date. And a couple different use cases. One is very obviously disaster recovery. Two different data centers. One blows up. You have the other to fall back on. Uh, but there's a couple other different use cases that are really interesting because depending on where your users sit, they're affected by latency. You know, your search taking a quarter of a s half a second or a second, uh, you know, piling tens and tens and hundreds of users on top uh, of that latency can, you know, cause performance problems. So uh, syncing data locally. So if you had a leader index and followers polling from it to three different locations, the users in those geographic areas could query and poll locally to those indices rather than having to go back to wherever the central uh, data center lives. And also in the other direction, you can have a central reporting cluster where you have data loading to three leader indexes. And you can have, you know, define the metadata however you want to differentiate, but you can load those back to a uh, single follower such that you can report on that locally. So it's just a uh, you know, really helpful method to both decrease, you know, cost of replication infrastructure um, and really keep users happy when it comes to performance of the clusters. Any uh, any questions? I'll just sort of pull the group as we go through the different features. Yep. Right, so availability zones, for that's more focused around uh, local HA. So if you got, you know, AWS, it, the replication is more focused around getting data between, for example, uh, AWS East versus West uh, than availability zones. Availability zones would be uh, how you would achieve sort of HA within a, com uh, a distinct cluster. So you want to spread the nodes across different availability zones for a single cluster 
and then the uh, shards for the indices will replicate across those nodes so you have a single cluster. But you would not want to do that across country because of the latency. All kinds of crazy bad things would happen to your cluster if it had to sync across country. So that's this is where that will help. That's why we call out sort of Canada, Singapore, Ireland. Like conceptually think of this as widely disparate geographic area. It doesn't have to be, but that's how you would use it. Right. You have to it's in index based. Yep, so if you want to do uh, another thought just comes to mind is if you have sort of cluster A and cluster B, you want to keep them both in sync sort of synchronously. If you had data pipelines coming into each index, you could have its sync index on the other side so that users can see a full copy um, of the data coming from either location. So a couple, di couple different ways to skin it, but you got to think about like data duplication, how does that affect the application, the load pipeline, all that good stuff. So I'll go to another one. I'll here first. There you go. I'll go to you there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, just, just the ones with replication turned on, right? So if there's a subset of data. Yeah, I mean, I if you're trying to get efficient with it, I would, you know, look at the data that's critical to replicate and perhaps have a cluster that addresses that volume. And then you can probably put a cross-cluster search node in front if you need to tie data together to try to be efficient with the, with the licensing. But otherwise, the two uh, clusters with that are participating in replication need to be that, that platinum license. Right. Yep. I'm sorry. I I'll come back, come back in there. Is there any network throttling or bandwidth management or anything like that? Uh, today. Time frames that I want to put for a maintenance window and I, wanna, I don't want any replication. Yeah, I think uh, th those are definitely things that engineering is looking at putting in, but not in yet. We're still in the beta phase up there, so it's more of like feedback gathering, you know, turn it on, what are the issues? Um, I mean, it's an important point because, you know, what if you have, you know, someone in your Kubernetes cluster fires up a new application, debug logs start flooding into Elastic, replication starts flooding across country. Um, and that's, you know, interestingly enough, I was talking with folks at uh, eBay a little while ago, and they were sort of looking at how they implement throttling to address that exact need. So definitely something we need to work out over time with it because you don't want to end up in that situation where you're just hosing two clusters and, and, and part of it is, is like uh, I don't know I, th I think figuring out how to limit on the front end like limit the, the application from like even participating in debug mode that can fire that volume of logs in your cluster is, is probably like the best way to go try to figure out how to li limit it on the front end because if you even allow it in the back end Suddenly, you've got to have a cluster that can auto scale up to this volume that like, can handle something that somebody's doing that they shouldn't be doing in the first place. So, but something we'll definitely work on over time. Right. Right. Configure audit beat incorrectly, and you're capturing everything from the root of a file system. Right. So. So uh, there'll be distinct clusters, and so you'll have to define your sharding strategy. Um, you could, it doesn't really, since the data is coming out of one cluster and just being loaded into another, uh, the source sharding strategy doesn't matter in terms of how the target's configured. It's going to load into however you have the target configured. Now it has to be able to accept all of the data, so you have to architect that many to one in a way where if you have three clusters pumping into one, it's got to be three times the size in many cases, depending on what you're sending over. Like if it's a very small subset of the data, you don't necessarily need a one-to-one -one or a match there. So. Any others? Good to go. Replication. Big topic. Big topic. So data visualizer. This is in the, uh, <laughs> I guess I live experimental. This is in the uh, uh, basic license. So the our data science community, uh, just folks kind of playing around, want to load some data. Um, didn't really have a easy way to put files into Elastic besides loading to the bulk, bulk APIs. 
And so we just wanted a way to say, hey, look, if you want to just uh, load a file in, just to understand its basic heuristics, um, or even analyze an existing Elasticsearch index, we should provide some sort of capacity for that, just to make it easy to get files in. So if we jump over to our local demo machine here, which is my laptop, there is a data visualizer tab up here on the top. And if we click on this guy, it gives you a couple options. So it's basically, I want to analyze an existing Elasticsearch index in my cluster, or I want to import a file for analysis. And import allows you to go through the analysis and also loading into an Elasticsearch index. So we'll just do you know, upload a file just to give you an example. I'll drag and drop a little file I downloaded here from the internet. It'll give you the uh, you know, basic a basic parsing of the file, so you know if you are ingesting it correctly. Uh, summary with the line, you know, looks at the first thousand lines, gives you a suggestion for delimiter, the format, uh, you know, if it has headers or not, the basic stuff you want to go through when you're trying to load data correctly. Uh, if it doesn't, cause it, it only does sampling, so it doesn't get it totally right. You have the ability to control that. So delimited file, you can change that header row, trim fields. You can change all the field names, so you have control over. Um, what the what the end index looks like from its field names perspective. And then as we scroll down through, we can get a distribution of values that are in each field. And it shows you the top values to like, you know, is this data interesting to me because I know what I'm looking for. So you kind of quickly ascertain that. And then uh, if you actually want to load it in, you can just click import and define the Elasticsearch index name. Let's call it add test three import this guy and we'll see if hopefully that'll work creating index pattern done and if we go to management index management rad test one two three is there with all the rows from that doc so it's now accessible nice and easy so that wasn't uh not everybody likes loading json to a bulk api so you know it's not always super friendly now load back up there's the demo um, there's, a, you know, to achieve any sort of disaster recovery environment, um, folks typically now run snapshots. They take data out in some sort of interval, store it somewhere, um, and it takes up a lot of room. And you don't always run into DR scenarios. You don't always run into scenarios where I have to restore all my data in my cluster. And it takes a lot of time and effort, and oh my God, we had a disaster. It doesn't seem, you know, it's a pretty rare event. So for those who want to accept the trade-off of storing less data but taking a longer time to recover. That's what sor source-only snapshot is. So in each Elasticsearch index, we store a full copy of the source document as well as its parsed rows in the index. And before this, we were basically taking all that data out to store in our snapshots. And folks said, look, I don't, you know, we just, we never, we just got to do this because somebody tells us we're going to have a DR environment that we never ever restore and it just takes up all the space and we don't care if it takes a little extra, extra time to, to recover. Uh, source only snapshot will help you be a bit more efficient on your, uh, your storage footprint. You'll have to incur the cost of um, rebuilding those fields as if you were to originally index them when you load the data back in for a snapshot, uh, but you'll be storing less data if that cost is high. Uh, ODBC client. Um, you can also to question whether or not the w is this wise to have plugging a BI tool into Elasticsearch. I definitely got some <laughs> amusement. Uh, I mean, out of the gate, there'll be like a subset of the ANSI SQL standard that we support, uh, the sensible things in terms of what the back end can, can do in Elastic, you know, aggregates, uh, you know, different sorts of sums, averages, and so on, uh, basic querying. But we're not going impl to implement the full ANSI standard, but it's just a group of folks out there who said, look, I use Tableau, I use MicroStrategy, or I just want to issue queries from a, an ODBC tool of choice. And I guess there's a big enough crowd that we built an, an ODBC and JDBC driver. So um, basically allows you to connect mostly from Windows systems. I, I mean, JDBC is, you know, you can use that in Linux servers and so on, but, you know, it's primarily... ODBC is primarily a Windows desktop kind of thing, but that allows you to connect B BI tools in and sort of absorb that community. Uh, but we'll see how that works out over time as folks start 
submitting very complex BI queries to Elasticsearch. So Java updates, we continue to kind of support the later versions that come out. Uh, Java 11 is now supported. Uh, the more interesting component of this, depending on how dense uh, you try to get with your nodes, is the G1 GC compiler. Uh, the default, gar and just <laughs> get a little technical, I don't know how many sort of developer folks from the crowd, but um, basically for the default garbage collector in Java, you want to, like, s there's, there's something called a heap size, and heap is ba basically allows you to store uh, pointers back to the data on disk so that the application, when it's running, can quickly access the data. And the maximum heap size you want to have with the default garbage collector is about 31 gig. Here there's this little trick you can leverage called compressed pointers uh, that give you double the heap if you're under 31 gig, and that's all nice and works out great. Once you go over that, you immediately double to 64 gig. So there's a window between 64 and 128 gig where if you want to try to get more dense with the data you store per node, uh, G1 can help out. But you got to know about, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I remember you from a prior meetup I talking about. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Let's, uh, if you do bad things, let's get you connected in engineering. Oh, good. Uh, well, if you're really interested in density, have you looked into frozen indices yet? All right, we'll, we'll follow up later, but yeah, absolutely. Hello. But Another question. Oh, sorry. Uh, is it still a good idea to split your memory 50-50, one for Elasticsearch and then one for the Lucene indexes? Uh, yeah, I don't... Um, the 50-50 thing I'm a little wary of. I think there's the hard limit for the default... Uh, garbage collector, I would say, is about 31 gigs, because once you get beyond that, you lose the compressed pointer trick, and you're suddenly eating, you know, most of your memory, your box for the heap. So, I don't know where the 50, 50 I, I've seen the 50-50 recommendation out there um, on a number of different blogs and stuff, and I'm, I wonder if, like, that came around at a time where maybe, like, 32 gig might have been the normal amount of memory on a box or something like that, but I'd, I'd keep it at max 31 unless you're using G1. Any other? Oh. Authorization realms. So we've had a couple different requests over time of, you know, it's great that you know, Elasticsearch can use custom auth realms. It's great uh, that we have, you know, role-based access control, all these good things. But I really would like to authenticate from one place and assign roles from another. So I want to authenticate fr from LDAP, but I want to assign roles to a custom realm in Elastic or authenticate in Kerberos, uh, assign roles in OpenLDAP. So this is a very sort of um, esoteric security need if you might have it. Uh, we have enough larger customers that have requested this that we put it in. So it's one of those, like, if it applies to you already, it's great. Uh, but we sort of only see so many, s so many of these in the wild. But good to know it's there at least. Uh, another little esoteric, uh, you know, nuanced thing. So if you leverage the auditing capability of Audit Beast uh, or turn on the auditing capability of the uh, security part of the stack. We just spit out this like unparsed, like unfriendly string every time we captured an audit event. And it's like, God, you got you to do better than this. We got to, you know, throw it in a JSON format, something that we're used to parsing, make it easier to visualize, easier to work with. So we kind of restructured that little bit uh, and also it's sort of like the foundation of some other things we're doing in the future here, but a little bit more accessible. It's one of those, like, if you already have the problem, it's really no, really, really awesome to know it's changed. But if you have, you haven't run into this problem yet, not so interesting. Some structured auto logging. So this is sort of, like, you know, if you're already using the, the platinum machine learning. So um, Elastic has focused uh, very specifically on anomaly detection on time series data for our machine learning. So we're super focused on logging uh, architecture and, and infra infrastructure ops and solving those particular problems. And you know, machine learning is a, is a very vast uh, series of disciplines. And if you're going to get good at any one of them, you really have to pick one and just dive deep on it, run into the problems that you 
you don't even know about yet with your customers and solve those and keep iterating over time. Because it's one thing to sort of, you know, deploy like an initial sort of you know, anomaly detection machine learning algorithm. It's another thing entirely to operationalize that across a thousand customers. It's just ab absolutely crazy. So we've run into some sort of weird esoteric issues over time. And one of those is normalizing um, anomaly scores over individual partitions versus across an entire job. And you got to kind of know a little bit about how this works to see the value of it. But basically, for certain blips on the radar, this one wasn't really, uh, we kind of were showing that anomaly would take place, but not the severity of it. And by analyzing individual par partitions against each other versus an entire job, which would kind of water down an individual problem, uh, we were able to better detect anomalies when it happened. And you have control over whether or not you want this turned on. And, and similarly, there's uh, something you define called a bucket span. When you're looking at and trying to model data over time, you kind of know, like, based on the ebb and flow of your data, like, you know, when certain events happen, how fast data comes in. And over a certain, you have to define a certain time frame that you want to compare now to the past to understand if there's anomalous behavior. And so what we weren't doing before was taking uh, anomalies that would take place at one, one bucket also happen in another, but treating them distinctly. But if there's a pattern, you should probably treat that as more important than something that's not a pattern. And so this capability basically allows us to have like a multiplier effect, whereas if there's a similar anomaly in the past, as one gets generated, say, you know, a week ago and today, we will uh, just, you know, give that a little bit more priority in terms of its importance. So this is just like little nuanced things you run into when you start trying to implement machine uh, anomaly detection on time series data. Let's go Kibana. So that was the kind of the Elasticsearch stuff. Uh, we'll jump into the Kibana uh, UI changes now, stuff we're new stuff that we're building in. Uh, Canvas, currently in beta. So this is kind of a cool visual interaction tool. Um, we wanted to kind of get to a higher place than just like charts and graphs and D3. You know, they all look cool and there's cool visuals you can do there, but it's like a different way to sort of be interactive and relatable with your data. And so what Canvas is, is basically a way for you to take pixel perfect graphics that maybe folks on the business side can relate to better Maybe you want to, you know, put your company logos on a, on a, on a dashboard. Maybe you want to create a cool sock or knock uh, dashboard with some interesting graphics that are relatable. Or even um, instead of, like, generating reports every week for bo your boss or your manager, have something that kind of displays in real time. So Canvas is basically the idea that we want to take something and make it look really nice from a visual standpoint, but build a data pipeline behind it. So there's an extensible... Uh, language where you can write a pipeline to affect the data that populates these uh, these charts and it updates in real time. So you can provide somebody with a link, have some cool chart. We have a couple that are designed around like understanding how busy, you know, uh, the TSA security line is at an airport um, or, or capturing, I think the next one here is, yeah, like the distance to Earth, the closest asteroid worth tracking. <laughs> Things like that, like, you know, destruction events, it's like, oh my god, you know. But having these graph, it, you know, you can kind of think of environments where having graphics like this, you know, allows somebody to engage with what you're trying to tell them uh, a little better than just having like a, you know, regular bar chart up on a, on a, on a TV screen or something like that. So Canvas is our way to, f you know, allow folks to get creative with data and how they represent it. Because there's different communities that just, you know, absorb and consume data in different ways. So good to sort of be able to interact with those folks in different different creative ways. Another example of how you might use some graphics to represent data with Canvas. So uh, when you log into Kibana prior to 6.5, any user that, you know, has access to Kibana can basically see all the metadata in it. If you, if, you know, if someone goes in and creates a bunch of charts, dashboards, and then I go in, log into Kibana to check out 
something or create some dashboards, I can see the all the work everyone else has done. I can't access it if role-based access control locks me down, but I can see it all. And that's not good in a lot of sit <laughs> a lot of ways that could be really bad. Um, so spaces is basically the first iteration of it is to separate that metadata based on user groups and roles. So I can be, you know, in the marketing team, someone else can be in the executive team, another 10 people on the sales team. And when they log in, they will only see the spaces they have access to. And they'll click on it and they get their, un their unique view of the metadata behind Kibana. And we want to extend this well, we will be extending this to be able to turn on and turn off all the links with the sidebar according to what you want the space to see. So if you just want someone to be able to see discover and visualize or adjust machine learning or whatever, you'll have that total control uh, over the UI. And that's that's pretty helpful versus like <laughs> everybody seeing all the, all the metadata for everybody else uh, in the environment. So let me jump out real quick you an example of this. So this is a uh, Elasticsearch demo environment out in the cloud. This is our latest release on it. I need to log out real quick. Hopefully the Wi-Fi is still connected. Looking good. So if I log in as a user I created, Brad Quarry, first thing I'm going to see is the spaces available to me versus Kibana the dashboard, the metadata, and everything else. And based on the space I select, I'll be able to see different things. So if I'm user one, log in here, and if I go to dashboards, it basically says there are none. Let's start with defining an index pattern so you can build a dashboard and data out. Right? And if I go down to the spaces here, since I'm an admin, I can see all the spaces. If I go to app logs group A, we switch contexts and we go to dashboards, we can now see that there's a dashboard that exists there that the other user couldn't see. Just to give you an idea how that works. And these all roll back to uh, the roles that you define and the users assign to them uh, in, in, in Elastic. So if I go to let me see, actually manage spaces, oops, manage spaces. And I can, you know, just do some basic editing. I can add like a custom avatar or have a description or whatnot. But basically, it's a little text down here. If you want to assign a, a, a role to a space, go to management and select roles. If we go here, select logs group A. We give this, in Elastic, we give rights to roles. And then you add users to roles to define what they can see and access. And then now we can also add, sp add spaces at the bottom here to say, okay, these users are now assigned to this space. So that's how that all, all the breadcrumbs kind of line up there. So that's spaces. Gone through a bunch of stuff. Any, any questions about anything I've talked about so far? Don't want to steamroll anybody if they have questions. So with uh, 6.3, we introduced a, uh, a roll-up API. And the value of rollups is, you know, if you're collecting log data and you have all this detail, super granular, very storage heavy, uh, it's really helpful if you only have to look at it in certain rolled up ways with uh, graphs and charts like, you know, hourly, monthly, weekly, what have you. The rollup UI allows you to take from a source index and load data into a target index in a rolled up form automatically. Uh, and the, we have built a nice UI on top of this in 6.5. So if you don't like building out a big nested JSON file to define your rollup, uh, this will do all that for you. So that's super handy. Um, you know, storage efficiency, super, super important, especially in Elasticsearch. You know, we probably get up, I mean, maybe like seven or eight terabytes of node if you know what you're doing. Well, 10 if you really know what you're doing. Uh, that's going to be changing very soon here with a new feature. It's called frozen indices, but it's not here yet. So we won't talk about that guy, but uh, this helps you be you know, efficient with storage, which is super important uh, to controlling cost. So if we jump out here real quick, go to the management section, roll up jobs. This is where you would start to define one. So you create a job, give it a name. So 
data flow. You can just give it any old series of indexes. Metric. Uh, roll up index name, so red test roll. And then, you know, the schedule, how often you want to run it. Page size, depending on how fast you need it to happen. You know, it's a trade off of how much memory you want to consume. And then if you're ingesting data at a really high rate, sometimes you want a little bit of latency in terms of when it runs, so you capture the entire window. So that's what the, uh, the latency buffer is for. I uh, think you can find a date histogram, so working with time series data. It's usually an at timestamp associated with the index. And just steps you through. Oh, time bucket size, let's do 24 hours. And just steps you through all the elements that you might want to aggregate on. You want to do a terms ag on specific fields so you can get that granularity. You've got to be careful there with cardinality. Uh, histogram, optional, all the metrics that you want to capture. You know, CPU, you can do like you know, system, CPU, you know, idle percent, use percent, all that good stuff. You can roll that up. And once you define all the metrics and save the job, now it's just loaded up in your roll-up jobs UI, and you have all the uh, different features of that defined on the right. You can get rid of that, edit it, that, good that kind of stuff. So that's super handy for being efficient with storage. Any questions about roll-ups? original index isn't affected by the roll-up job, right? It's just sure. It's according to its regular life cycle. Right. Uh, so that's where index lifecycle management comes in, in terms of um, when, so with time series indices, usually what you do is roll in, roll out, and you would roll up before you roll out, and eventually the roll out will just purge would roll in, the yeah. detail. Yep, so you just define like, here's my cluster, it's this big, it's, the, it's designed to handle, you know, 60 days of data at 50 gig a day, and it stays there, and then, right. yeah. Cool, thanks. Yep. So beat central management, if you deploy an Elasticsearch cluster and you're uh, logging data, you're most likely leveraging our beats, which are designed for very specific file types from all kinds of different applications, Apache web servers, Nginx web servers, you know, you know, syslog, all kinds of uh, predefined sources where you just plug it in and it starts shipping data to an index. Uh, those become sort of unwieldy <laughs> over time uh, as you have a thousand servers times six beats a server and doing all this different work. And so we decide, well, it's probably time that we built uh, a UI to help you manage those things and manage the configuration files for each of those, where they are, you know, leverage some tagging so you can understand categorization and what beats belong to what servers, things like that. So this is sort of our first uh, iteration of the of the beats central management UI, uh, just to help you sort of, you know, rationalize that uh, uh, that 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 whole volume of, of uh, beats that you're that you're trying to uh, deploy and manage. So if we go uh, to the management section, beat central management down here, and we can start just by it and it's also really important to note that everything we do in Kibana is interacting, for the most part, interacting with an Elasticsearch API, REST API. So if you want to instrument something to be a bit more, like for example, you'll, you'll see me go through this and you'll think, well, how do you do a thousand of that? Something we're thinking about, uh, but the answer usually is to start instrument it through uh, the API to register the beats and use the UI as a visual. So we can start uh, just uh, really easily enroll a beat. We're gonna use file beat just to check out like what this looks like as I enroll it. Uh, we basically have the command file beat, you know, enroll where the file where the file beat lives and a, a unique hash to understand uh, what beat it is, where it's coming from, that sort of thing. And once you click on uh, the process to roll a beat, it sort of sits there and waits for you. Says, okay, you see what you want to do, and then we can run this guy and it'll basically register file beats uh, in Kibana. Place config. And we can see file beats now registered here to hostname Elastic Mac local with a particular version. And um, it's important to note here that, that we have a tagging system for categorizing 
uh, all the beats and where they come from and what the context of the beat is. And uh, so you can try to come up with a little system yourself to kind of figure out what makes sense. Uh, is config. And then add a configuration block. So this is called file beat module. We can select, you know, like uh, audit D. We can specify, you know, any sort of additional config items we want here. Hit save. Oh, I want the dash. And it saved that config. And then we can optionally sort of, you know, go back into configuration tags to find different tags that are related to different configuration types and then associate those with new beats that we register. So it kind of, it's our beginnings of trying to be uh, really efficient with like, how do I manage a thousand of this and through a UI? It's not quite there yet, it's version one, uh, but that's going to be super helpful for folks who uh, need to leverage beats. Any questions on that? Good. So function beat. Um, sort of the desire to operate in a serverless environment. It's definitely a whole population of folks who just either for speed of development or, you know, my application doesn't really demand dedicated servers or all kinds of different other reasons. Uh, AWS Lambda is super helpful for just spinning up an app, go let it run on the servers behind Lambda. I don't care where it runs, just make the thing go. But Lambda is, you know, uh, you can monitor the app using CloudWatch logs and SQS, and there's some great, uh, you know, pipelines and, and features in AWS to ship that data off and analyze it, uh, but not specifically for Elastic. So Function Beat is our way to consume CloudWatch and SQS logs in a serverless architecture, so that as you run your app and you want to collect all the logs associated with what happened when you run it on the servers that you run it on, and that will ship data out to an Elastic Search cluster uh, relative to the uh, application that you shipped off to the serverless environment. So our first iteration is to address AWS. Um, next one's Azure, GCP, uh, maybe Alibaba in the future. Um, but as this becomes more popular, we want a way to, just for folks to leverage it, because right now it's like, you know, I have to run my application and s like put the logs somewhere, like an S3, and then I got to load them to Elastic in a manual way with the bulk API, and it's just, you know, not as clean as it could be, so Function Beat helps out a lot with that. Heartbeat GA, so this is sort of our, we continue to kind of push this path towards observability, if anyone's familiar with that term, kind of the latest buzzword out of Silicon Valley. Basically means I want to know about, you know, logs, metrics, APM, heartbeat, I want the full stack of information that I find relevant, uh, you know, in a dashboard in front of me with the ability to correlate and jump between uh, the stack to understand how I solve problems faster. It's all about MTTR, mean time to resolution. So heartbeat is really just table stakes. It's like, you know, very, you know, this has been around forever. Heartbeat's very common. You can do uh, ICMP, uh, TCP, and HTTP out of the gate, uh, and basically have a UI to manage uptime and understand uptime for your, for your servers. It's just part of the stack, so it's basically like we're coloring in some of the standard blanks here with uh, Heartbeat. Log stash. So there's all kinds of devices out there that you just can't install a beat on, like a phone or a router, network switch, things like that. Um, and so we thought, okay, well, that's a lot of data coming out of those devices, and they're interesting to monitor. So what can we do there? So we built an SNMP input plugin to log stash that basically allows you to capture all information uh, and this <laughs> does a lot of cool things out of the gate. Capture the information, build elastic search indices aligned to that data, parse it all out, and build some initial dashboards to kind of understand it, uh, basically just by loading data. So it's pretty cool. And so, you know, <laughs> SNMP stands for simple, uh, a, a simple protocol, but it's really anything but that. Everybody implements it a different way, it's done different versions and standards. So basically, it just started with uh, version one. 2C and 3 over TCP and UDP, which covers like the bulk of what you'd want to uh, monitor for SNMP. So there's that plugin. Infrastructure UI. So this is a this is a really big one. Folks have been asking for this for a long time. So it's really interesting to see sort of the evolution of like, oh, I got some logs and metrics over here, and we're trying to figure out how to integrate them. 
So now I have a stack of log metrics and APM. Uh, and now I have the ability to have log metrics APM in one system and use machine learning jobs to understand when anomalies take place while actually having to have eyeballs on a chart, you know, all the way to these, you know, crazy Kubernetes environments where you're spinning up hundreds and thousands of Docker containers. Uh, and like, how do you manage all that? How do you even like get your arms around it? So we're very fortunate that uh, eBay decided to build in to file beat and metric beat the ability to auto discover uh, Kubernetes pods as they spin up uh, by looking at the uh, Kube, Kube API, the Kube logs, and we'll recognize <coughs> uh, when nodes spin up. Uh, and metric beat will ship that data to Elastic so we can automatically recognize that in the infrastructure ops UI. And then as data goes out to Elastic, it will annotate that metadata with the pod metadata so that you know what pod it came from and when. Because you can't use IP addresses because they're so dynamic. So that's super cool. And it basically allows you to, you know, you can monitor, you know, bare metal hosts, VM, VMs, the Kubernetes in integration is there, or just the standard Docker container environment. That's in beta, uh, but I'll show you a little bit of it right here. So we jump on our cloud box here. We have an infrastructure tab on the left. Load this guy up. Uh, this is basically showing us the availability zones that are defined within this demo environment. We can switch over to see all the Kubernetes pods in the environment. You get a basic heat map along the bottom that shows you how busy each server or pod is based on the metric you've defined. So you can, you know, group by namespace or node. And then within that, you can look at, you know, CPU, memory, inbound, outbound traffic. Um, what's kind of cool is that you can, within each pod, uh, you can view either logs or metrics at the moment. We're actually looking at <coughs> putting a little gear icon here somewhere to where you can move logs, metrics, or link out to a custom dashboard not there yet, but something we're thinking about just to kind of give you more drill in ability. Like what if you, you know, if you define a dashboard to look at all the things of interest related to your environment and if you could use this as a to pass the metadata, like this just the very basic filter of this pod's name to a dashboard and use it as a search filter, you can immediately get to that dashboard and understand everything about that pod. So you can already do that today with the with the view logs button here. We can load this guy up. This is basically a real-time log tailor. Um, I'm going to add a future slide on this, but the point I want to make is that we pass the metadata about that pod onto this UI such that it's filtering all these logs uh, based on that pod al uh, alone, So, which is kind of cool. Because when you're trying to like do troubleshooting and figure out where the problems are, it's just nicer to not have to like type in this wonky pod name as a filter to understand which logs you want to look at because we're trying to pass that that stuff on automatically so it's nice and clear. So if we look at the metrics side, I'll give you some, you know, these are some just basic charts out of the gate. Like this is version one of the UI. We're taking a lot of feedback from the field, you know, what would be interesting to change? What else would you want to see? I mean, this is basically an extension of like, you know, if you want to see the a dashboard, there's a lot of ways we could extend this. We could link it out to a custom dashboard. There's a lot of different things we could do, but it's sort of, you know, version one, basic metrics. Uh, so you have visibility over, the you know, your entire, uh, you know, Kubernetes, Docker, uh, or host environment. So that's a basic free feature that you can check out today. So logs UI, just sort of, you know, ran you through that. You can uh, see it stream real time, stop stream button up there, play and stop, just to kind of like, it's really handy to, you know, perhaps have three tabs open in your browser to do the three different logs that you want to look at in real time, and just sort of bounce back and forth between them as they stream in real time. Not everybody likes to, you know, look at, you know, terminal windows all day. Uh, it's a nice place to have like a, you know, a cleaner visual of log data as it comes in. Uh, we have a, an open source APM solution. Not everybody knows that. Um, we have this long-term goal of a full stack logs metrics APM. So we 
uh, acquired an APM solution. We're kind of feverishly building that out. I can't say it's you know feature competitive on a matrix standpoint with like a you know uh, Dynatrace or a New Relic, uh, but the but the you know the model is open source. Play with it; it's free. We do have a licensed UI that you can put on top of it if you don't want to build your own. But we will generate all the data, store all the data in Elastic, parse it all. You can use all the agents completely open source. And so that's the model to get people to adopt it as we march towards feature competitive with the new relics and Dynatrace of the world. So we just released uh, agents for Java and Go. Um, so that's, a, I mean, a most applications in this world that I run into are written in Java. Go is super popular because it's a lightweight scripting language to build applications. Um, super helpful to have those as being able to uh, uh, trace within your applications. Uh, distributed cra tracing across microservices, something we just uh, released in beta. So if you have a transaction that runs, it goes to your cart microservice, it goes to your product microservice, your cart microservice, all these different steps. You can trace across those and also drill into the, uh, the detailed traces for that particular step in the application. So that's really helpful in trying to understand like, well, what happened to this transaction that somebody submitted it from you know, the cart or what have you? Because there's probably about 50 different places it'll hit before it uh, ends up being a complete transaction. And then uh, basically a monitoring UI on top of the APM server. So you have all these different agents running, accepting trace data from your application. That all flows to a central APM server. And for every server you have, you have to monitor it because every server has problems eventually. Uh, so this is a monitoring UI we built on top of the APM server uh, just to understand all the interesting things you might want to know about it and your, your traces coming in from APM. And with that, that's it. Hope you learned a thing or two. Uh, pretty, pretty extensive fire hose of information. I will put the deck up on the Meetup website so you can download and check it out later. Um, but any questions before we we're ending out here? No, good. All right, thank you. <laughs> Probably take a take a few minutes. That was a lot. All right, everyone. I think we're gonna get ready for part two. And if there are any questions during the presentation, because we are recording, it is a lot better um, from an audio perspective if you guys do use the microphone. So just wave me down, I'll run over, hand you the microphone, so you can ask your questions. All right, and I think with that, we'll pass it off to Simplicity. Cool, so how's my mic? There we go. How about our, uh, see if we can get my beautiful presentation up. Am I still plugged in? There we go, hooray. All right, so that was indeed a fire hose. That was super <laughs> impressive. Thanks so much, Brad, I learned a lot. Boy, there's a lot to learn. Um, we've got a, you know, a not quite as big a fire hose. Uh, a lot of technical details here in a presentation on putting together a big log management um, deployment. I had a couple of questions before we start. Um, how many, uh, just quick show of hands, how many sort of developers, engineers do we have? Because I can tailor my, s my stuff a little bit here. So, And how many people are at least vaguely interested in the security log analytics use case for Elastic? A couple of people. <laughs> All righty, well that's good. Um, so I'm George Boitano and this is Murali. I'm Murali Venkataraman. Cool. The impor most important thing to remember with this presentation is that this is Murali's very first presentation <laughs> <laughs> after a whole career <laughs> in technology. So I want to hear some hecklers. <laughs> <laughs> I need some people to fall asleep loudly. <laughs> that would be a <laughs> good idea. If you all want to chart, you know, file out on mass halfway through, that's good too. I want it to be a memorable experience <laughs> for the rally. One I'm looking never forward to it. One that you'll never forget, you know, <laughs> baptism by fire. And uh, <laughs> the way we're gonna work this, so now that we've got that straight, uh, the way we're gonna work this is I'm gonna do like the fluffy easy slides here at the beginning. 
Um, <laughs> but I'm still going to say some things that are really wrong, and Morelli's going to correct me. And then he's going to do sort of the more interesting technical slides uh, near the middle and end. And uh, actually, heckling is fine, but also if you want to break in for some questions, that'd be great. If you, if, if you see that we've done anything wrong here, and you have a better way to do it, uh, that would be fantastic. You know, it needs to be like a two-way exchange of information because this is just how we did it based on our reading and what we actually accomplished, but I'm sure there might well have been better ways to do this, and it would be good to know about them. So, all right, those are our ground rules. So, with that said, I will start yapping. So, here is the really quick marketing slide and the la last and only one. We're consultants um, specializing in elastic and modernizing legacy SIM. The way we uh, got into this was um, we were SIM log management consultants way back when it just started out. A couple of years ago, it became really apparent to me that um, all the technology that we're using to manage our logs and detect events is you know, rapidly becoming obsolete because of the issue of storage and the proliferation of logs. And I sort of decided that Elastic was the way to reorient the company. So we're a managed service provider for Elastic uh, and we also consultants for Elastic, and that is all I'm going to say. Um, this is also a nice, fluffy, and quick slide. We have our own view of log management in SIM. Uh, I have a, you know, fluffy white paper out on it, uh, but you don't have to read it because it's all here. You know, I view it all as a uh, pyramid, and it's based on the historical evolution of this product space. So, you know, we started out early on at the bottom of the pyramid with the idea of having to ingest a whole bunch of logs and store them securely. That was driven by compliance requirements around the turn of the century and a little bit after. So people started storing their logs according to standards where they couldn't be tampered with. Uh, they started searching these logs and, you know, security logs are the bomb, right? There's all kinds of informa interesting information there. I say that only partially sarcastically because <laughs> it's sort of all I've been doing the last 18 years. Um, but uh, there is a lot of interesting information there, and so at a certain point, people became really interested in connecting these logs together and gleaning security insights from the logs. The particular insight they're looking for is, you know, we, we've been owned by a <laughs> foreign country or something. They're looking for breaches. They're looking for stuff in the security logs to indicate something bad is happening. That's the, you know, near the top of the pyramid with correlation and alerting. That's what SIM is, S-E-I-M. Uh, it's the combination of this pyramid up to that penultimate layer. And these days we're seeing uh, all kinds of new applications for security logs, not based on known correlation rules, but rather on machine learning and analytics and anomaly detection. I don't believe that any, I think each layer is dependent upon the layer below it. There's some vendors in this space uh, that will tell you something different because they can't actually store or parse the logs. but. My feeling is it all starts with the storage of the logs and the parsing of the logs and the enrichment of the logs. And from that, we build up our use cases on top of that, including all the way to the analytics and machine learning. Uh, all right, I'm off my soapbox now. So let's talk about uh, a particular, we're consultants and we work with various clients. We tend to be large enterprise, but we'll do smaller too. Um, this particular situation we're in, I, these are you know sort of the requirements. I'm, I'm not just going to read my slides, but uh, we'll just say that they had legacy log storage left over from, you know, 2004 that couldn't scale up anymore. And the reason is because there's millions of logs, there's more logs than there used to be from the existing devices, and there's all kinds of new security logs. Also, uh, there's a lot of M&A going on. So when you buy a company, you buy their logs. <laughs> so the storage mechanism for keeping these logs and parsing them was super slow, and it was super expensive. And uh, that's, you know, across the board with uh, most of these legacy log management solutions, they really have trouble keeping up with the volume of log data and the proliferation of it of the different sources. Um, so we proposed, hey, you know, the answer to this problem is elastic because we can scale that out no matter how many logs you have. And it has beautiful parsing capabilities and searching capabilities. We'll be able to, s we'll be able to um, search really quickly with it so that the people who are using these logs can actually use them so in human readable time. So the people who use them are the, s the people in the security operations center who are 
looking at logs to figure out if something terrible has happened or you know they're the they're the incident response people who are looking at logs to f after something terrible has happened <laughs> and trying to figure out how it happened there's the hunt team who i don't know you know they're running around with spears and try you know arrows trying to like catch stuff that they don't know is happening um and uh, you know, we built it out for just a simple use case of being able to search these logs because we can't do any correlation, we can't do any security analytics unless we have really fast response time against parsed logs. Um, so we have some follow-on use cases there, but that was that was those were our requirements. Um, we needed fast response time. We needed to store a whole bunch of logs. Uh, so our metrics are: uh, we needed to retain them about 30 days. Uh, we needed about uh, of 120,000 events per second we needed to ingest um, into Elastic, which came out to about 31 terabytes a day of storage. This is the initial one. It's going to be three times this size in a year. Um, and, you know, we really wanted to be able to, like, if you did a single keyword search in Elastic, we wanted it to come back, you know, in human readable time, like five or three, like right now it comes back in like a second for a single keyword search, um, which is couple of orders of magnitude faster than the existing solution. Um, you know, in terms of our log sources, you know, there was a lot, this is a big enterprise, there's a lot of log sources, but our principal ones were Windows servers and firewalls, a lot of firewalls. These are, this is how many we had to store over 30 days. Web proxies also, you know, you can imagine web proxies take, get a lot of stuff. There's all kinds of other sources in there as well, identity management, uh, you know, DNS, routing near craft or NetFlow someday. Uh, but these are our principal log sources, and that's enough for metrics, I think, unless you guys have any questions. Um, so what happened was that we inherited a whole bunch of servers. Uh, you know, the, the first question is, right, this is an on-prem installation, and uh, we decided on ECE to do it because it's just like going to be an awful lot of node, and nobody wanted to just be maintaining them all individually. And we like ECE. We think it's a really interesting product. So um, we started, we inherited 60 repurposed servers that were repurposed from another really expensive event detection mechanism, which I'll remain nameless. But we got them. Uh, they each had 256 gig of memory, which isn't bad. They had 32 uh, CPUs. Is that right? Yes, 32 cores. Of, right. And uh, they, but unfortunately, they only had some small SSD drives, and then they had spinning 5K disks. Uh, and the disks were all of different sizes, um, which, you know, made this deployment kind of interesting. Like, if you're going to deploy a lot of nodes, a lot of ECE instances, really helps to have servers of all the same disk size. It makes all the calculations a lot easier. We didn't have that, unfortunately. <laughs> so and I, guess oh I guess I just want to add one more point there. So they had 24 physical disks, and out of that, only one disk was SSD. Remaining were all spinning disks, so that that added uh, like more time to ingest those logs using log stash. Go ahead, stop. Sure, no problem. No, don't be sorry. That's your job. <laughs> and uh, but we did get great response time out of even this thing with spinning disks. We're going to be adding on a whole bunch of SSD to this implementation this year, and do a hot warm. But uh, you know, we made the decision to go with ECE. We made the decision to go with an all hot kind <laughs> of uh, infrastructure for now. And uh, we uh, the key metric we determined was the storage ratio of 1 to 98. And uh, we'll talk about how we derive that later, rather than your alley one, because I could talk about it, but it won't make any sense. Um, so this is the high-level EC design, uh, which I think we can kind of see. Yeah, there we go. So this is just, uh, there's not, not a lot here, but you know, we have these director coordinator um, instances, they call them an ECE. Right. So the director coordinator are basically resource schedulers and uh, view keepers. And then you have allocators where your existing uh, instances of Elastic and Kibana runs on them. And then the data gets stored there. And then the proxies basically which handles the user requests. And also the log stash uh, requests are indexing requests goes through the proxies. So let me break out here for a second. Um, how many people here are familiar at all with Elastic Cloud Enterprise? Oh, there we go. Yeah, you're new. That's good. So let me give you a bit of a, uh, 
uh, a little bit of background on that. So if you've got a whole bunch of elastic nodes, basically what it does is it containerizes your elastic nodes so that they all run in nice Docker containers and, uh, and, it, you know, and it controls them, hence the, you know, the zookeeper is the configuration propagator. It keeps track of them all and it controls them and it turns them on and off. It does a lot of really nice stuff if you've got a whole ton of nodes. Um, and so we made the decision pretty early on that that is what we wanted to use uh, for this implementation because it was going to have an awful lot of nodes. And I don't remember how many, how many Docker containers do we have running? Right so now. Right now. Uh, in the whole farm. So right now we have about uh, 56 Docker containers. Then instances, as far as the instances are concerned, allocators are about 48 of those. Okay. 48 uh, allocators are running, and out of which uh, each allocator is able to handle about four instances. Four or three allocators, instances, or nodes, basically. So that is like this, the biggest challenge with Elastic and ECE, and maybe with Elastic in general for people who have only been in it a couple of years like that's is terminology, right? Because you've got the concept of a node, you've got the concept of a host, you've got the concept of an ECE instance, you've got the concept of an allocator. So if anyone gets confused with our terminology, just, just bust in and we'll try and, to the best of our ability, disambiguate it. One of my favorite parts about Elastic Cloud Enterprise is that it doesn't have to run in the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Another source of great confusion. So these are this is an on-prem installation, all with servers on-prem. It could, you know, we could deploy it in a private cloud or even using the Elastic Hosted Cloud, which is what they use. The Elastic Hosted Cloud uses ECE. But um, but it's by no means limited to the cloud, and you know all the deployments we're working on are on-prem for ECE. But that's a very good question because it's a source of grave confusion, and was for me as well. Alrighty, so let's go on here. So here's our. Uh, this is what rec Elastic recommends for availability zones, and you've probably seen this before. A lot of the stuff that you do in Elastic with just regular nodes is mirrored in ECE. So, um, you know, they're looking for three availability zones so that we don't get a uh, split brain problem. Um, and, you know, different zones have different things in them. Uh, so we configured that based on the network switches. This is all in the same data center. So, you know, we, we looked at the racks and the network switches and tried to keep each zone, you know, as isolated from each other so that if somebody, uh, you know, spills a gallon of water on the rack, <laughs> <laughs> There's some hope that the thing will keep running. <laughs> uh, this is what we actually implemented. Um, so uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about this, Mariah, or Yeah. So, well, so as George mentioned, we bas basically created three different zones based on the switches, network switches, and each zone. We made sure that there are three. Each zone had a proxy, and then. And then coordinators, as uh, as is uh, shown on the slide, and then we also had uh, hardware or disk hardware constraints. So basically, we combined the proxy and allocator on the same uh, instance or server. So because uh, so so the idea, the recommendation is to go have dedicated proxies, but since we had constraints, so we went with uh, one server having dual roles, so like the proxy and allocator, and rest of them were all pro allocators. So we have got about 48 allocators in our environment that we have set up. And would it help to go over like this ECE terminology? Are we losing people on it? Does anyone want to hear what like a coordinator and a proxy and an allocator instance is? Or, uh or not, because uh, you know either way it's fine with me. All right, so you want to talk a little bit about like you know a coordinator, a proxy, what the different roles are. Or I'll be happy to do it too if you want. Sure. the The coordinator is basically a distributed coordinating system, which uh, and also a resource uh, scheduler. Any uh, any request comes in, the coordinator 
the proxies handle it, and then the I guess the that's the role that's the definition for coordinator is basically a distributed coordination so the coordinating system and it's also a resource scheduler but it's also in our deployment there is also a director in al along with a coordinator which basically is a zookeeper of all the resources that are available and then the proxy basically handles the user request and any log stash requests coming in it handles it and the allocators basically handles or runs Allocators where basically your Elastic and Kibana instances run on them, and also your data gets uh, stored in them, in those allocators. Any questions? Did I, I lost? One. Did is I lose you? Is it safe to say like the coordinator is like sort of like the master node if we weren't in ECE? No, I do not believe uh, coordinator is the master. Master is just the coordinator between the resources that are available in your ECE deployment. I see, okay. Cool. So master comes in in play in your each, every each deployment or cluster. That's where okay. the master comes in. Cool, I see. So this is by zone and the master gets by cluster. Excellent. Yes. All right, well I learned something. That's good. Those are those are in in the individual instances. Like if you have a yeah, the allocator. yes, it's part of the allocator. Yes, that's where you can you have the option of having a dedicated data node or a dedicated master node or dedicated ingest node, or you can have a combination of all three of them in the same instance. Mm -hmm. But the allocator is where the work's getting done, and all it's doing is it's spinning up Docker containers. And those Docker containers contain like the data nodes, and the uh, it keeps track of them, and it spins up new ones if you need them, or that sort of thing. Gets rid of old ones when you don't need them anymore. That's what ECE is doing, but it's just spinning up data nodes. Uh, the al that's what the allocator is doing. So most of your action is all in the allocator instances. Okay. So. Um, here are our clusters. Now, EC calls a cluster deployment now, but I'm going to call it a cluster. We, uh, the first thing, I think the only thing we really want out of this slide is the idea that one thing we did that was right was we set up a sizing cluster in EC, a separate cluster to just for ingestion of nodes. And it only has retention of, what, one day, right? Or there's dismiss no rate. ingestion. Uh, there's oh. no retention. There's no that. retention, yeah. So we ask, we complete with the sizing exercise. We delete the existing, whatever indexes we have created when we start with fresh. So that's like our test node. And the idea is when we get our fire hose of data, we point it at the sizing uh, no cluster first. And then we mess around with all the parameters inside that cluster to try and see if we can ingest the data such that you know it's immediately searchable and elastic. And uh, there's, we'll talk about the parameters we have to adjust, but our methodology, which is the only thing I think is, you know, the main thing that's important on this slide is, you create this sizing cluster, you have a few, you know, one EC instance or two dedicated to it, or it's, I don't know how many we have. So how many hosts do we so have? So it's, uh, it's basically a single instance, uh, single instance running on a single allocator, and also with a single shard, that's basically what the sizing cluster deployment is. And it's basically, even though we have three zones, it's a um, single zone, one zone, single uh, node, and single shard. And so what you do is you point your fire hose of logs at that first, and then you see like how it behaves, and you make decisions based on that about the parameters that you're going to need when you actually create your cluster to hold the log itself. So the one additional thing that we did as part of this sizing exercise is we set up a monitoring deployment and we sent all the monitoring logs to the monitoring deployment so that we can look at the EPS uh, that the elastic is in the uh, indexing, indexing rate. Also, we can look at the log stash metrics as to how my, what's the incoming 
uh, rate and as well as the outgoing rate of the events that the log stash is able to handle as well as how much uh, elastic is able to handle in terms of index indexing also the latency latency and all those things we the elastic is able to use right so that's really important as well like we created a monitoring cluster to hold all the logs so we could tell because you know this exercise you know as we'll see when things go wrong when you start to ingest a log when things go wrong they stop they're not, don't get ingested in the Elasticsearch database on time. So the logs you see are two or three to 24 hours old. So now you've got to figure out where the problem is. Is it in your network? <laughs> is it in Kafka? Is it in Logstash? Is it in Elastic? Is it in the front end of Logstash? Is it in the back end of Logstash? Is it in the load balancer? It's usually in the load balancer. And, <laughs> and then, you know, or is it on the Elasticsearch ingestion side? And all these metrics will help you figure out what stuff you need to tune if you've got a big volume of logs coming in. Okay. So Morelli, I'll let you uh, talk to this. So this is the, uh, it's a little snapshot from the EC2 uh, configuration of the whole thing. Okay, so so we started, uh, we started, f we started with a single node uh, in sizing cluster or the deployment and then we had, we started with a single shard, no replicas, and we went with a, the port mapping that came with, okay, I guess the source for the proxy logs is Kafka, which has already had those events parsed in Ceph format. So we didn't have to do any additional parsing in log stash except we had to do enrichment of data, like the, the source address, destination address, we wanted to get the GOIP information for it. And also the additional, I guess that's that's where we started. And we started sending those logs into Elastic. And we, st we see, we, we determined what the daily index size was, which was about, uh, which was about 30, no, 2.6 terabytes of data per day, and based on that, we came up with how many uh, shards we need for 30 days, and how many nodes we need for, how many nodes we need to store the data for for that uh, duration or for the period. So with that exercise, uh, we basically created the proxy deployment with six nodes with a 64 gig RAM. And and uh, basically, since we are going with uh, six node and 64 gig RAM, it basically created three master nodes on each individual zone and one Kavana instance. That will, that allowed us to keep the data for 30 days, 30 day retention period. Replicated. With the uh, replica, yes. Cool. So, yeah. Are we all right there? Yeah, this is it. All right, cool. All right, here's the crux of how this stuff works. <laughs> um, the storage density, which is just, uh, you know, it's the amount of storage you have divided by the amount of RAM. Determining this, uh, you know, is dependent on how much disk you have and how big your machines are in terms of RAM. If your disk varies by machine, this is hard. So did you want to talk to that a little bit, Mary? So so we, e even though we started with 256 gig RAM and we had variable uh, disk sizes like 26 terabytes and 19 terabytes. So uh, after the installation of ECE component, ECE components and services, we don't get all the 256 gig RAM. We were available, the available RAM was only 213 uh, gig. So that's basically what you will see on the EC Cloud UI page. So based on uh, based on the available space, we so it was what, uh, 23, 22 terabytes after the installation of EC components and then 213 tera gig RAM, so came up with uh, 93 
the disk memory to disk ratio came up with uh, 93 or 98 as the ratio for density purposes. And so the idea is that, you know, you will how much data you can store is dependent on three things. The amount of RAM you have, the amount of disk you have, and the density that you can support. Um, and that calculation is what is super important. Um, so let's let's take an example here. As we were just saying, if we have a uh, 256k of RAM, we can't use it all. Uh, we have 24 terabytes of storage. The storage density is 1 to 93. Now we have to figure out uh, how big our nodes have to be. So, so we started. Uh, so since this was our first time, we started with a smaller. Uh, memory like uh, 16 gig nodes so we within few days of how we started with the sizing and with the deployment we found that the injection we were getting the log injection was uh, was delayed so we basically the logs basically pointed out that we needed more capacity uh, we were it was basically throwing the 429 error basically saying there's not enough resources. So based on those error messages we went with, we basically changed or resized the, the nodes to be 64 gig RAM, 64 gig nodes that gives more storage. Okay. In terms of your, um, of using the cloud and the Azure cloud, is there any scalability up and down that you can dynamically uh, leverage, or is this kind of a static configuration that just leverages the, the distributed nature of the nodes? You can uh, you can size your nodes based on your requirements. Suppose you started with uh, 20 nodes of uh, 16 gig RAM, you can go up to like what if you have the capacity, you can increase the number of nodes. And also, you can increase the memory to 64 gig nodes. That's basically what we did. We started with the eight nodes, and then we went uh, we went up to 24 nodes, and with 64 gig RAM each. So, if we assume that on a certain day there is a cyber attack, and all the logs start getting crazy, and the volume increases, and the speed increases, will the cluster be able to kind of dynamically scale up and ingest? volume of those logs? It won't do dynamically. I think you'll have to manually grow and shrink your deployments, uh, deployment okay, nodes. Thank you. So uh, is that how you can scale out? Because if, for example, you want to deploy it on AWS or EC2, uh, I would assume that you should be able to dynamically add. Oh, but you can scale out. I mean, but you have to do it. It won't happen automatically. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We we ended up we are doing it. Uh, yeah, so we basically that's what I'm think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Brad. So that's basically what it is. So if you have the capacity, like if you have 48, uh, we have about 48 allocators. So and if your deployment is small, if if you have if your cluster is not able to handle the incoming EPS, you can grow your instances or the nodes. You can increase the allocators, uh, increase the instances to whatever you want. Yeah, but just don't see the benefit when I'm using the ECU because I'm really the same. Like I have my cluster with no ECU, and you know when I see that the performance goes down or something, so I just add five more nodes and I will get that same. I mean, it's added capacity and added IOPS and added. RAM, right? I mean, so what does ECU give you then? So if you have an unhealthy uh, allocator or instance, you ECU gives you the benefit of moving them from one allocator to another, to a healthier allocator and maintain, do the maintenance on that. And also the flexibility is the, uh, the amount of time it takes to do the upgrade of a uh, per version. Like 
if you if you were to do it uh, if you if you were to do it manually on a regular cluster, you may have to take downtime and all those things. With ECE, if you have the capacity, you can grow that will allow the indexing to happen without being affected. And also at the same time, the shards from existing index uh, nodes will get migrated. So there's no downtime in terms of the user's ability to search, as well as the pipelines indexing will not be affected by it. So that's the benefit I see in the last eight, seven months. Right, and I also think though, correct me if I'm wrong, if you were to, oh, I mean, we're running here at capacity because we have an, you know, an infinite number of logs to pick up. Um, and uh, you know, it's the volume is such as pretty steady, so. But you could overbuild these with less storage density and more. Um, you could overbuild these so that you know the nodes themselves had extra capacity on them to handle stuff. Um, we're not doing that because we have just so many logs coming in. But that would be another way to handle like the issue of like a giant spike in security logs, which fortunately hasn't happened yet. But thank you for that. So let's talk about shard sizing for a minute. This is pretty simple, 60, 60 oh, gigabytes. Oh, it's actually about shard sizing. <laughs> 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 but I'll ask you the question. Um, when you say you go from an index that has 16 shards to 32 shards because you scaled it up, um, how are you rebalancing them? So I think EC, the, the when you add more nodes, EC does it automatically. You don't have to do anything manually. Uh, any manual effort, manual effort is not in, Required for the shard rebalancing. So based with the with the, so for example, we went with, we did an upgrade uh, over the weekend from 6.4.2 to 6.5.4, and one of the allocator had uh, issues. So we ended up moving the n instances to a new, uh, moved the. So basically we moved the unhealthy allocator, allocator instance from an allocator, all the shards got m moved to our new instances and it did the uh, shard rebalancing by itself. We didn't have to do anything. Right, and we talked a little bit about that too. So there's our shard sizing. We found six, you know, 60 gigabyte shards works best for us. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, back and forth in the community about the right shard size and people believing that, you know, it can be bigger, um, but we're, we're doing fine with six. I, th I think the, the other point I would like to make there is with 60 gig, it's easier for searching and also easier for migration. If you go with higher shard size, the amount of time it takes to migrate the shard from an existing instance to a new instance, it will take forever to complete. So that's basically what we I have uh, learned in the last six months. So the initial shard size was about 100 gig. So it, take, it took for ages. So I, can, I would have gone back to India and come back. It wouldn't have finished. So I realized and we added more shards and also made sure that the shard size is about 60 uh, gig. That daily, that definitely helps with the migration process or the upgrade process. Right. It's just the shard size and, and it was migrating from one, not on the same node, same allocator, but it was migrating to another allocator, uh, so it was it was just the size that was ma that mattered. But do you think it was I/O or network or CPU? I guess we never <laughs> we, we didn't know. never determine root cause. We just made the shards a little smaller, and it, you know, yeah. So on the storage front, you said that you had dissimilar and heterogeneous nodes in the cluster. Uh, from a disk perspective, how are you exposing those disks to each instance of Elasticsearch? Was it just like JBOD or single disk or anything? Uh, single volume group, basically. 
single, uh, so basically we combine them into a, a volume group and then created a logical volume combining all those groups okay. and then came up with a size of 23 terabytes and 19 terabytes. All right, and question. I think we'll keep the rest of the questions till the end since we're coming up on time. Oh, okay, okay. We're getting there. Um, so yeah, in general, I think we'd say like, you know, the smaller shards, uh, the faster ingest, um, but you know, there's more shards, which, you know, slows down search. I think it, it will also, the, the smaller the shard size, like uh, with 60 gig, the respo response time is better as compared to what if you have 100 gigs of shard, it will take that, uh, it will take longer for the search results to come by. Okay. That's basically what has we have realized. So let's talk a little bit about log stash and we, we should probably go fast. Um, so the basic point is that scaling log stash is, a, you know, perhaps a little bit more complex than scaling Elasticsearch. Log stash does not at this point run into ECE. Um, you can run it in a Docker container. I think there are plans to do so. So it's a separate, separate thing that runs, you know, we found that it was um, better to run it on its own server. Uh, fortunately, getting the data was easy because we had Kafka, so we just subscribed to topics and all the logs come through on that. Um, but then, you know, we've got to figure out how to tune Logstash so that it's not a bottleneck. Um, so what we did was we took sort of our lower disk, the, the servers without a lot of disk that weren't going to make very good data nodes to begin with, and we said, okay, you're going to run Logstash. And uh, we've got some really high CPU servers coming online this year that will also run Logstash on. Um, we made sure to send all the log stash metric data to the uh, to our logging cluster, um, as shown. And here's you know just a sample of configuration. Th this will be up on the uh, this will be up there. Um, so this was important, and we'll you know we'll spend a lot of time here. If we don't finish the presentation, we won't. Um, so uh, log stash can only leverage the same number of threads as Kafka partition. So typically 60 consumer threads are available to, to uh, Logstash, or it's, is that the default? Or? So it, uh, so basically the topic that was created in Kafka was about 60. The topic had 60 partitions. So those are the number of threads you can have in Logstash input configuration. So you can you can go with one Logstash instance with consuming using all 60 threads, or you can have 10 with six threads each. So basically, that's basically what it is. You cannot, uh, I guess you can define, you can specify threads that will add up more than 60, but anything extra, anything over 60 partitions or threads won't be utilized. It will remain idle. It won't do any work. Yeah, because like a Kafka partition is just a window in, like I can read off the Kafka bus. And there's only, for this one, it's limited to 60, and that's a function of the Kafka infrastructure. So you have to tune Logstash to Kafka, right? And, uh, you know, if you over, if you say more than 60 threads, it, it won't help. Um, also, we found that splitting up Logstash on different servers, uh, as one would imagine, allowed us to get past the ingestion bottleneck, right? The first bottleneck we run into is Logstash, getting the records, turning them into JSON and firing them off to Elastic, right? That's the first place that stuff can slow down. I guess it could slow down in Kafka too, but we haven't seen that yet. We haven't seen um, So what we found was in our tuning was that it made much more sense rather than running one big log stash with 60 threads, yeah. obviously, you know, run four log stashes with 15 threads on four different individual servers. And that way we managed to get like nice high, you know, 45K EPS, um, for just a single topic. Uh, you know, there's some help there on the JVM side as well. Um, if you don't tune Logstash at all, we found it maxes out at 2,000. Uh, but you, if you tune it, it can get way faster. Uh, the mapping is super important. Um, you know, you don't want to map uh, fields that you don't have to. Um, you know, you have to, you want to... Um, drop fields that aren't of any interest to you. You don't want to index stuff that you don't have to index. 
this all content, this will be on the site. You know, this is a super important field that allows freeform searching of the log records. So I don't have to know like user ID equals George. I can just type in George and it'll bring me up all the log records with George anywhere in the content. Uh, that's useful, but it's expensive because you have to concatenate all the values in the JSON values into one big field. So you have to be a little bit, uh, you have to be a little bit, um, you know, brutal about saying I'm not going to be searching on this field. This isn't something that anyone's ever going to do it, you know, search on. And so there's no sense putting it into all content. Like a simple numeric field, you know, with values of one to ten probably doesn't belong in all content. Who's ever going to search on the number ten? That's just not meaningful. Uh, obviously, if you're not going to search on certain fields, like certain numeric fields, then don't index them. Uh, so the last part of this presentation is, um, you know, problems that we ran into. The pro the symptom that you see most often is, as I said, ingestion delays. Um, and uh, the biggest problem we had, I would say, is uh, yeah. yes. So we started with, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, we started with uh, 32 gig RAM and 3.06 terabytes. So the ECE, ECE, the version before this, like 1.1.5, didn't allow us to add instances with from the graphical interface. So the only way to do that was to update the plan to add additional data uh, sections, data sections within the plan and save the configuration. And so basically what happened was the the earlier versions, the shards didn't get rebalanced, but we didn't have this, we we're not having this issue in the latest uh, version of ECE. So basically what happened, the, the newer nodes that were created or the instances that were created there were no shards allocated. So when the daily index for the next day got uh, automatically generated, all those shards, the 21 or 42 shards that were allocated, part of that daily, part of that index got created in those two or three additional data n data nodes Serve, that we added. Yeah, serves, yeah. So basically because of that, we had ingestion delay or the indexing was delayed by 24 hours. So so basically what we what we had to do was to go into each of those uh, so basically go in exclude those instances so that the in the shards will get rebalanced into other uh, instances that that were part of the deployment so that's so the other thing uh, i guess that was that was the problem but one thing to keep in mind with the newer version is to make sure that there is no the the cluster based uh, uh, cluster routing or the index routing allocation is set to all or or ma basically make sure that it's set to all so that the shards will get allocated to all the nodes or instances that are available as part of the deployment otherwise you will have end up having this problem where the indexes will create get created on, on the instances new yeah. with fewer nodes, with fewer shards, not nodes. Right. So Sorry. if you add some service to the deployment, they'll take all the ingestion on themselves. And that's not what you want. You want it to be spread out among your whole farm. And that's what that parameter does. Uh, so that's basically what it says. Make sure that that's set to all. If it's set to none, then you are you will have this problem where all those shards will get created on instances and your indexing will get delayed you'll have delayed indexing so we'll run through these really quick this was one dear to my heart uh if you make a mistake in your yml which is nice and easy to do uh and you deploy it via ece um you don't get a syntax error you get like the thing continually boot looping and if you have the deployment strategy set to anything other than rolling, when you kill it, it deletes the Docker information because it doesn't need it anymore. So you can't get the log to see what your syntax error was. So that's annoying. So um, we, you know, our strategy for this was to set the deployment strategy to rolling so that 
those Docker containers do persist for a while, so you can go track down and actually see the syntax error that you uh, that you created. So that's a gotcha. Um, we had a problem with restart hung, but we'll skip over that um, because it's no longer an issue with the new uh, restart. We'll talk a bit about cross-cluster search. ECE is coming out with a new cross-cluster search feature. I know cross-cluster search is fine with the existing Elasticsearch nodes. The only gap between uh, you know, what Elasticsearch can do on its own and ECE is that ECE was built originally to prevent cross-cluster searching uh, so that you wouldn't have cross-contamination of client data. It was supposed to be running in a multi-tenanted situation, and this particular cluster should never be able to have it talk to this pa other particular cluster, and, um, and they c you should never be able to search across them, and that was to prevent, I used to work in an MSSP, our favorite thing, data contamination, where somebody gets to see another client's data. That's always bad. Um, so, uh, but unfortunately now, like in a big EC deployment like ours, we want to be able to do cross-cluster searching because each cluster corresponds to a log source. So people might want to say like, hey, where does George appear in the proxy logs and in the Windows log? Because I want to correlate those two events together. It's super important for correlation and event detection. So EC is coming out with that at the end of the month, which is super important for us because the client really needs it. Um, and uh, even though it's already supported with, you know, non-ECE Elasticsearch. So here we are at the last slide. Um, <laughs> um, so these are sort of our takeaways. Uh, you know, I think, you know, you've got to consider the hardware and, uh, you know, it's hard to uh, readjust this RAM to disk ratio. It's not that easy. So you have to make the right decision at the beginning. Um, you have to set aside hardware for the Logstash architecture. That was what we figured, well, we'll just run Logstash on the Elasticsearch ECE nodes and we'll put five instances on the same server. It won't be any big trip. Eh, that does not work. <laughs> you, know, you need to have Logstash running in a nice parallel environment so it can handle the ingestion because uh, no matter how fast Elastic is, uh, you know, if the events can't get out of Logstash, you're stuck. Um, and then in also in Logstash, you can really improve performance by giving some thought to which fields you want to map, which fields you want to be searchable just by text. Don't just take all the defaults because um, you'll waste a lot of space and, uh, and you know, a lot of other resources. And I don't know if any other takeaways for you, Morales. I think there are, there are settings available in Logstash uh, uh, configuration, Logstash YML, as well as in Elastic uh, cluster or the deployment that you can play with to make sure that the EPS is where you want to be. So we, I, I did play with those settings to make sure that the EPS of 45K we are able to achieve ba based on tuning those settings. Okay, so that's it for us now. It's very disappointing because we had no hecklers at all. <laughs> and nobody fell asleep and no one stormed out. Though I wouldn't have blamed you <laughs> if you did. Yeah, so we'll get off the stage now unless anyone has any questions. Are we done? Excellent. Thank you all very much. We really enjoyed that. That was fun.